Example 159.1 Tech. Exercise researchers are interested in the effects of two variables on maximum bench press in trained males. The two variables of interest are the amount of time, 120 seconds, 360 seconds, or 720 seconds, the pectoral muscles spend under tension during four training sessions, and the number of days, two days or four days, of recovery between the training sessions. The participants did not have significantly different maximum bench presses prior to the start of the intervention, and the four training sessions were conducted with sets involving a load of 75% of the participants' baseline maximum bench press. 36 participants were randomly assigned to six different groups, and the response variable measured was the amount of weight lifted during the maximum bench press at the completion of the training intervention. Use the SPSS outputs below to answer the following questions. Okay, so let's scroll down to where the questions are, and then we'll take a look at this. But just before we leave, I do want to mention the general design of the study. So basically what they're doing is they're looking at how much recovery period or time or rest you're giving your pectoral muscles, and then they're looking at the amount of time that they spend under tension during the workouts. So time under tension is actually measured literally as the time that the weight is in your hands and you're lowering it down to your chest and pushing it up off your chest. So the minute that bar touches, say, for example, the rack again, that no longer counts as being under tension. So of course, you know, you may have a 20 minute workout, but that might only entail having 360 seconds of tension on the muscles themselves. Okay, so let's scroll down and take a look then at the questions they want us to answer for them. So we have a list of all the output here as we scroll past. Okay, so here are our questions. Looks like there's actually a few here. There's A through M. M is off our screen right now, but we'll scroll down and get to there eventually. Let's start with part A. It says identify the factors and levels for this experiment. So this is pretty easy. The factors are essentially time under tension, so I'll just say time to be short. And the time levels were basically 120, 360, and 720. And then we had rest, right? And for rest, it was just two and four as the levels, two days of rest or four days of rest. All right, for part B, it says this two-factor factorial experiment can be referred to as a three by two. Where does the three by two come from? It's just a reference to the levels for each factor, right? Because there are three levels of time, right? And two levels of rest. For part B, it says give an example of a treatment for this experiment. How many different treatments are there? All right, so I just gave ourselves some room to answer the question for part C. It says, give an example of a treatment for this experiment. So an example of a treatment is just a combination of factor levels. For example, you could have 120 seconds under tension with two days rest, right? All right, and how many different treatments are there? Well, how many different pairings can you make between the time under tension and rest levels, right? Since there are three times under tension possible and two rest levels possible, it's three by two, and in other words, six total possible treatments. Part D says how many replications were used for this experiment? Well, they said that they had 36 subjects, remember? So that would be 36 people involved in the experiment, but only six treatments. That means that we must have, if they're divided up equally, six replications, right? In other words, for every treatment, there were six people undergoing that treatment. That's why we had 36 participants with only six treatments. They assigned six people to each treatment. It gives you a total of 36. If you want to check that in another way, you can also scroll up and take a look at the data they gave us, right? You can see here that for for two days rest and 120 seconds, there's one, two, three, four, five, six measurements, and you have six measurements for each of the other combinations. You can also see the six treatments here, right? 120 seconds, two days rest, 120 seconds, four days rest, 360 with two, 360 with four, 720 with two, and 720 with four. There's your six treatments, and there's your six replications for each treatment. Now the next question they asked is why do we have to have replications? Well, the reason we need to have replications is so that we actually have error for our model. In other words, we wouldn't have anything here. We'd have no sum of squares for error. This would be zero, which would be a major problem for the model, right? So there has to be replications to have error. There can be no error with just one number, right? You need to have the variability that occurs between the different outcomes for the different replications, and that's where our error comes from. So again, the second part of this question is that we need the MSE, right? That's why we need replications, or else we would not have a mean square error. Okay, part E, it says, what does the plot of the marginal means indicate? Let's go take a look at that plot to see what it tells us. All right, so there are a few important things we can see from this plot of marginal means. So we can see, first of all, that this line is significantly different from these other two, right? It's pretty far away from these other two. So I'm guessing that it's going to show a significant difference between those levels of tension. That line is 360 seconds under tension. 
and it appears that that is significantly different from the other two levels. There may not be a difference between these two, but we certainly can see that there seems to be a difference between 360 seconds under tension and the other two levels. So basically what you're looking for is separation here. How separated are these lines? And they look pretty well separated. Okay, we can also see that it seems like each of these lines are sloping upward, right? Which means that it seems that four days of rest has higher what? Maximum bench presses, right? Then the two days of rest, right? The corresponding points for two days of rest all seem to be lower than their four-day counterparts. It appears that there might be a significant difference between the amount of rest you have, right? So four days of rest might be better than two days of rest. That might be a significant difference as well. Lastly, you can see that the lines seem to be parallel to each other basically, right? You know, eventually it looks like that might like crisscross together, but that's probably not gonna be enough for us to say there's an interaction effect. In order to see an interaction effect, you'd have to have something occur where, imagine if, for example, this point on the graph was actually over here and then these connected like this. Then, you know, you would have this kind of different trend. You know, we've been expecting based on what we can see here that the two days of rest was always worse than four days of rest for each of the other factors levels. But what if, for example, with 720 seconds under tension, there was some kind of weird interaction between those two things that for whatever reason, you actually got a better result with just two days of rest with that much tension. Then you'd have this sort of crisscrossing effect where the lines here crisscrossed. And whenever they cross like that, that indicates that there's an interaction effect going on. So whenever they crisscross like that, it indicates there's an interaction going on. However, we don't see that here, right? It looks like the lines are basically parallel, so I'm going to guess that we're not going to find an interaction effect. But there will probably be two main effects, meaning that both the tension and the amount of rest you get is going to be significant. So the answer to the question, what does the plot of the marginal means indicate? I would say no interaction, and it indicates main effects. So in any case, there's probably main effects, but no interaction effect. All right, for part F, it says complete the missing parts of the ANOVA table above. All right, so let's get to it. It looks like we're missing the error sum of squares here. In order to get that, remember that these sum of squares should add all up to the total sum of squares. So if we just take this total sum of squares and subtract these other sum of squares from it, we should be left with the missing sum of squares, which is the error sum of squares. So we'll use subtraction to get that value. All right, so we'll have 7,287.5 minus all those other values. So 4,512.5 minus 1,056.25 minus 29.167. And we get the answer 1689.583. All right, let's get the degrees of freedom next. So there were three times under tension. So if you take the degrees of freedom for that, it'll be three minus one, which is just two. For rest, there were two rest levels, two days and four days. If you take one away from that, you just get one. Time by rest, you basically multiply the two degrees of freedom above together, so it'll be two times one, or in other words, just two. All right, for the corrected total, the degrees of freedom there is just the number of subjects minus one, or the number of measurements minus one. Remember, we had six treatments. Each had six replications. We had 36 subjects, so take one away from 36, you get 35 for that. And since that was 35, we can get the error degrees of freedom just by subtraction again. So 35 minus 5, right? 2 plus 1 plus 2 is 5. That will give you 30 for the degrees of freedom for error. All right, for the mean square, we basically just divide the degrees of freedom into the sum of squares next to it. So we're basically going to do 4,512.5 divided by 2. And that gives us 2,256.25. So... 2256.25. One into any number just goes in that many times. So we'll have 1056.250. Then we need half of 29.167. That'll give us 14.5835. Then we'll divide the error sum of squares. 1689.583 divided by 30. That'll give you 56.3194, and that's it for our mean squares. All right, I'm gonna store that 56.3194 into X here, so I have it in my calculator without rounding it, and then I'm going to divide that into the factor sum of squares, and I'm gonna do that to produce my F test stats. So I start with the first one, it'll be 2256.25 divided by that stored error variable that I had, and I'll get 40.062. 40.062. All right, now I'm going to do the same for the rest factor. 1056.25 divided 
divided by that stored error value, and I get 18.755. Okay, and we can see here that the p-value for both of those f-test stats is significant. The p-value for the interaction effect is not significant. So it looks like our interpretation of the marginal plots was correct. So part F is completed. Part G, it says, what is the p-value for the f-test statistic related to the interaction effect? What should we include about the interaction between these factors? So we just talked about that p-value not being significant. Let's take a look at it one more time. So we're asking for the interaction effects p-value. Remember this significance here stands for observed significance or p-value. And we can see that that number is very large. It's 77.4%. Remember a large p-value means you do not reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis here says that there is no interaction effect basically, right? So if that's the case, then we're saying there's no interaction effect basically. So we're gonna say no interaction effect. Part H says, based on the results of the test for an interaction effect, is it appropriate to test for main effects? Well, yes. So again, you wouldn't test for main effects unless there is no interaction effect, right? So if there's an interaction effect, you don't go after the main effects test. You go ahead and look at the interaction effect in more detail if you'd like. You maybe analyze the different means that result as the factor levels interact, but you don't bother to consider the separate main effects if there's an interaction effect. So here, because there is no apparent interaction effect, we should go ahead and look at the main effects to see if the time under tension and the rest are significant. All right, so for question I, it says at a 5% significance level, does the amount of rest between workouts affect the amount of weight lifted during the maximum bench press? I would say at this point, yes, because the p-value was what? Very small here. The p-value was equal to 0 0.000. That's less than 5%, right? And as a result, we reject the null hypothesis that says there essentially is no difference between rest times. So we're saying there is a difference. So J, the same thing then, it says at a 5% significance level, does the amount of time the pectoral muscles spend under tension affect the amount of weight lifted during the maximum bench press? Once again, we would say yes here, and the reason why is that the p-value, again, is very small. The p-value was, again, just 0 0.000, which is less than 0 0.05. Okay, let's take a look at K then. So K says, use the results of the multiple comparison procedure included with the SPS output to construct a diagram that ranks the means for the different times under tension. So if we come up here and take a look at that, all right, so if you come up here and take a look at the multiple comparison procedures that they've done for us in SPSS, you see they have a bunch of replications of results. So some of the things we don't need to look at more than once. In other words, they make a comparison between these two times under tension, and therefore we don't need to look at this comparison because it's the same. It's just done in a different direction, but it has the same overall conclusion, right? So we can essentially ignore this row of the table. Likewise, we're going to do 120 and 720 here and here, so there's no point in looking at this comparison, right? And then, of course, when we end up doing 360 and 720, we'll have no need for this comparison here because it'll do the same thing. Okay, so let's take a look at the first comparison. When they compare the 120 and 360, you can see that the interval limits are both negative. And when the interval limits are both negative, it means the second mean was larger than the first. What that means is that 360 seconds under tension produced a greater maximum bench press than 120. So I'm going to say that that means that 360 is greater than 120. Okay, let's go on then to the next comparison. It looks like they're doing 120 and 720, and the interval limits here actually go from negative to positive, meaning it includes zero, so there's not a significant difference, but it is a little more positive, right? 13 is a lot more on the positive side of the number line than negative 1.3 is. So I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that since it's more positive, it means the first mean is larger. So I would say 120 is greater than or equal to 720 here. But I have to include the equal to part because the zero that's in the interval. Okay, one more comparison to make, and that's this 360, 720 comparison. If you look at that interval, again, it's entirely positive, meaning that 360, the first mean, is bigger than the second one. So 360 is greater than 720. Okay, so I have my three results there. Let's try to express that in a summarized diagram. So it looks like if I'm going from small to large, 720 is probably the smallest. And then we'd go up to 120 and then 360 at the top. And then if I wanted to connect the ones that are not significantly different from one another, I'll draw a line above 720 and 120 because of the 
equality symbol that's there, the greater than or equal to idea, right? So even though 120 is slightly bigger in terms of the sample mean, it wasn't significantly bigger. So there's my diagram. So 720, 120, 360 with a bar on 720 and 120. So again, it'll be 720, 120, and 360. And we'll put a bar above the 720 and 120. Okay, question I, it says, why is there no multiple comparison output for the rest factor? Which level of rest produces the greater maximum bench press? So there are only two factor levels for rest, so we don't really need to do a multiple comparison procedure if there's a significant difference, which there seemed to be based on that p-value, right? Then all we have to do is look to see which one had the higher sample mean. And just from our marginal plots diagram, you'll probably remember that four days of rest was greater than two days of rest. So I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, two and four would be the diagram. Or in other words, you'd say that two days rest is less than four days rest when it comes to maximum bench press. It's better to have the longer rest period. So for M, it says summarize your conclusions for this ANOVA two-factor factorial experiment. Oh, the conclusions are pretty simple. There's no interaction effect. And basically, if you're going to recommend a treatment for someone who wants to gain strength in the bench press, you would say that you should shoot for 360 seconds under tension and four days of rest between workouts.